joining us. Uh, I'm going to jump right into a few things and then I'll turn it over to public health uh, for an update. Um, first off, as a lot of folks know, yesterday we launched uh, Vinny, the Vaccine and Immunization Network Interface. Uh, huge success. Uh, we're, so we're very thankful to all the folks who work behind the scenes to make that happen. Uh, those individuals that are part of Phase 2A, uh, that being school staff or child care, camp staff, they are now signing up for the vaccine appointments with some of those appointments actually being administered today, which is uh, very exciting. Um, to date, over 10,000 individuals uh, in just the past uh, 24 hours have signed up for appointments. So um, we're really trying to build on that success. Uh, and so that leads us to this coming Monday, March 22nd, uh, a date that we were talking about about a week ago. Any New Hampshire resident 50 and older can sign up through Vinny uh, to get their vaccine appointments as part of phase 2B. So we're already going to have the next phase. We're rolling right into it. 2B re registration opens up this coming Monday, March 22nd. Uh, right now, the system is loaded with about 200,000 first dose appointments through April. It's a huge number, uh, so folks shouldn't worry about having to be just the first one in line. There's going to be plenty of room uh, for everyone, but it does start this Monday and available for anyone um, who is looking for that appointment. And then as more vaccine becomes available in the coming weeks, we'll keep adding more appointments so folks can even move themselves up to a more um, or, you know, convenient date if, if they so choose. Um, and assuming all goes well with the registrations as part of phase 2B after the 22nd, uh, we do plan on expanding vaccine access to all of our citizens, 16 and older, uh, in just a matter of weeks. So we don't have a firm date on that yet, but it really is just weeks away that any citizen, adult citizen in the state of New Hampshire uh, will be able to go to Vinny and sign up uh, for their vaccine uh, as well. So uh, things are just progressing very, very quickly here uh, in the state. Great job by the, our, our entire team. Um, and again, as we continue to vaccinate folks, uh, we get closer and have more ability to do everything from ease up restrictions uh, and really hopefully put COVID in the rearview mirror sometime in the near future. Um, you know, we've always said he should plan for a good summer and I, I was still very much on track for that. Um, and in, in kind of that spirit, if you will, uh, in following with that theme of a strong summer, today we're also releasing a few more guidance documents to help some industries uh, thrive and have some success. So we're modifying the guidance documents around amusement parks, tourist trains, and the performing arts, uh, three areas that the Open Up, New, Reopen New Hampshire, or Open Up New Hampshire uh, Committee looked at. And, uh, and again, provided some recommendations to both my office and Dr. Chan's office. And um, uh, we were able to release those today. Those are online. Uh, folks can see them. They're updated, very simplified documents, which I think is a, a, a great ease, I think, for a lot of the individuals managing those businesses around the state. Um, I also want to go over some details about the $1.9 trillion spend dollar spending bill uh, recently passed in Washington. There's a lot of a lot in this bill that we've been working to unpack. And this is just, a, I'm just giving a kind of a brief smattering of some of the financial opportunities that we've seen come out of this. Um, ultimately, what has been defined in the bill still has to have guidance documents and kind of the rules, if you will, around the, the details of the spending. That comes from the U.S. Department of Treasury. And so we still haven't seen any of that yet, but uh, what we have been able to discern so far at a kind of a 30,000 foot level is approximately $966 million uh, just to the state. So that's a, a huge opportunity. An additional $457 million to cities and towns and counties. Um, $122 million in critical capital projects. And again, I'll, figuring out exactly how they're going to define critical capital projects versus other capital projects. Some of that still remains to be seen. About $350 million to our schools. And again, how that money can be spent. Will it come in the traditional uh, funding mecha mechanisms and, our, and appropriations that have they have come in the past? We're, we're still not completely sure of yet. Uh, but that's obviously another huge opportunity for, for uh, dollars into our school system. Um, and then approximately, it's hard to ascertain, they haven't really determined the formula yet, but approximately $100 million or more to things like vaccines and testing and contact tracing, uh, things that we really rely on for, um, in working with the Department of Health and Human Services to manage uh, the health care aspects around the COVID crisis. There's a lot more money in this bill for the state of New Hampshire. There's no doubt about that. The stimulus checks, which have started to roll out, a lot of folks are seeing uh, d direct deposits into their accounts this week. Um, the unemployment uh, 
uh, stipends that come on top of our traditional unemployment opportunity. Um, we're still, you know, it's still a little frustrating. New Hampshire did get about a 20 percent increase over what we got in the original CARES Act from last year. But states like California got a 270 percent increase. So the unfair kind of distribution of the funds is still a little bit frustrating. But as you can see here, there is definitely a lot of uh, financial opportunity for the state. Um, I've been working with the, the legislative leadership uh, kind of in collaboration to really unpack this, understand what, how this money could be spent, um, with, whether certain dollars go into a bill, whether it goes to fiscal committee, what it might look like. Certain dollars will probably run directly through Gopher, uh, which we still have. Gopher will be there to ensure accountability and transparency in this entire process. They've done a great job with that so far. Um, and allow some of those dollars to flow directly and quickly to Health and Human Services uh, so they can react uh, more, more um, uh, nimbly to the COVID crisis, uh, but with all the capital potential, the one-time capital projects and the money that could come out of this, working directly with the legislature is going to be a key aspect. Um, and the one thing I will say is in those discussions have all gone very, very well, and we all agree this is a huge opportunity for a good one-time investment that can help decrease costs and property taxes for our citizens. So whether it's a clean drinking water project or a wastewater treatment plant project or broadband infrastructure, lots of different things that this money can be spent on. But uh, it's one-time money. And so we want to make those investments not just for today, but investments that will be long lasting and help really reduce the cost and the burdens uh, for our citizens. And as we said, this is just kind of a smattering of the opportunity. Uh, we know there's going to be a lot more um, uh, a lot more to come potentially out of this bill really depends on those guidance documents. So as soon as the Department of Treasury releases those, we'll be back and talk a little bit about uh, how those guidance documents look like, the timing of this, that still remains to be seen. But these dollars will be spent over a period of a couple of years. This is not money to be spent tomorrow. Probably this year and next year is how they'll roll this out. So um, there's going to be a, a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, lastly, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, just to, to jump and then we'll open up for, for the public health update with Dr. Chan. Um, I did call on uh, Department of Health and Human Services to assess the operations and infection control practices at the New Hampshire Veterans Home, which unfortunately, as many folks know, experienced uh, one of our most severe COVID outbreaks last year. Uh, over the last few weeks, the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services Healthcare Associated Infections Program and Congregate Settings Investigation Unit, I know that's a mouthful, uh, but they worked w directly with uh, the staff at the Veterans Home at a variety of different levels per, and, and provided recommendations um, after performing an on-site infection control assessment of that facility. Uh, the, assess the assessment they conducted utilized, here's another mouthful, bear with me, the CDC Nursing Home COVID-19 Infection Control Assessment and Response Tool Facilitator Guide. Uh, brevity is not a common thing in Washington apparently, but um, uh, these uh, are kind of the assessment document and guide. It's a very lengthy uh, process that they went through uh, following the CDC protocols, undergoing uh, this investigation just to look at the practices both uh, during the outbreak, but also going forward as well. So um, the, we're making this report public today uh, following the press conference. Um, and again, their charge was really to provide suggestions on how to make the, the veterans home prepared for any of the next potential challenges. Uh, uh, not just through the COVID outbreak, but uh, making sure that long-term uh, things are in, in place uh, just for the protection of their workers and, uh, and their residents. Um, some of the highlights, here's just some brief highlights. Again, the, the detailed report will be provided today. Um, testing supplies were not an issue, and overall testing went very well with minimal delays, and 95 mask supply was not an issue. Uh, the Veterans Home had a dedicated COVID-19 unit with dedicated staff and equipment, which helped mitigate the spread uh, of those outbreaks. Uh, they followed the correct, cor correct screening procedures as folks were coming and going uh, from the facility. So uh, those uh, issues really did work. Um, overall, it was a very positive report which is great. Um, but like many facilities across the country, there were some issues. Um, that we know that during that nationwide gown shortage, if you remember, no one could find gowns. Um, I got a, the, the report was very complimentary, and I think some of the adaptive procedures that the staff took, um, while they did not have uh, gowns and some of them had to be reused, things of that nature, but they did it in a way to minimize the contamination risk. They did a very good job with that. Um, and while there was a, an adequate supply of PPE, um, we talked about the staff needing better training on how to properly utilize PPE and empowering others to do so as well. So it's really kind of the training tools that we want to make sure are, are up to speed 
uh, for everyone uh, that is working both on the floor and administratively uh, within that facility. But all in all, it was a very comprehensive review of the practices and the protocols of the Veterans Home. Uh, we just want to thank everybody that was involved with that review um, uh, from the top down. Uh, and we will make the re full report along with the review process they undertook from the CDC public um, uh, following today. Uh, with that, we're going to swing right over to uh, Dr. Chan and the team uh, for the public health update. Great. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, we are reporting 347 new people diagnosed with COVID-19 uh, in New Hampshire. The average number of new infections per day over the last week has increased slightly uh, to around 200 and 250 to 300 uh, new infections per day. And so the active uh, case count, the active the p number of people with active infection is currently 2,340. Uh, our test positivity rate has also uh, been stable and hovering right around 3.5% the last week or so. Uh, the, the, last, uh, the most current average is at about 3.6% of our antigen and PCR tests combined um, have uh, been positive for COVID-19. And the current number of people hospitalized is 75. Unfortunately, we have five new people to report that have died from uh, COVID-19 today, bringing the total number of deaths related to COVID-19 during this pandemic in New Hampshire uh, to 1,207. Uh, in the last week, the last seven days, there have been 16 people in total that have died from COVID-19 in New Hampshire. Um, I, I want to um, note that most of these deaths, the majority of these deaths, about 80% or so, uh, are actually occurring in community settings and not long-term care facilities. Uh, and so I think the effectiveness with which we have rolled out vaccine to our long-term care facility residents and staff um, is having an effect. Uh, but we know that there remain vulnerable individuals in our communities uh, who are susceptible to COVID-19 and the severe complications of COVID-19, including uh, the need to be hospitalized and, and even dying from disease. And so we now have three vaccines uh, at our disposal that we are rolling out. All three of these vaccines are uh, very effective at preventing symptomatic disease, symptomatic COVID-19 and very effective at preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so I want to continue to strongly recommend and encourage people uh, to take the first vaccine available to them, the first appointment that is available. Uh, and we are looking to try and rapidly increase um, the number of needles that we put into arms. Um, and I want to stress again that until we have um, a much higher level of vaccination in our communities, we continue to need everybody, including people that are vaccinated, uh, to practice social distancing, uh, wear face masks, well-fitted face masks when in public locations, continue to avoid the um, larger group gatherings. Um, and if anybody has symptoms, even if they uh, have prior immunity or protection from a previous infection, or even if they have immunity from vaccination, uh, people that are symptomatic should still seek out testing uh, as one of the ways to identify transmission in our communities. And with that, I will hand things over to Dr. Daly. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'll provide some vaccine updates. To date in New Hampshire, 472,000 doses of vaccine have been administered. This includes 322,000 people that have received their first dose or started the vaccination series, which is 24% of New Hampshire's population. Of those, 161,000 people have been fully vaccinated, which is 12% of our population. In the last week, we administered more than 60,000 doses of vaccines in our state, including both the first and second dose doses. And then this week, we received 34,020 first doses of vaccine. This does include a very small amount, about 1,600 doses of the Janssen Biotech vaccine. We expect to receive a similar amount of vaccine next week. Our phase 2A regional vaccination clinic started last Friday on March 12th, and to date, 31 regional clinics have been held with 6,500 people in phase 2A vaccinated. An additional 36 regional clinics are scheduled through the end of March with plans to vaccinate another 20,000 people through these regional clinics and more regional clinics may be added as well. Phase 2A people who were not invited to one of these regional clinics were able to begin registering to get vaccinated at a state or hospital run site yesterday around uh, 
10,000, over 10,000 people, have you heard, have booked appointments. People working in any of these settings, this is the K through 12 schools, our child care facilities and youth camps, should register to get vaccinated if they're not attending a designated regional clinic. There are plenty of appointments available for everyone to get vaccinated in this group. And again, as you heard, registration for 2B will open up on March 22nd at vaccines.nh.gov, and that's for everyone 50 and older. And we encourage all grant staters to get vaccinated as soon as they are offered the vaccine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Brief long-term care update. Um, today we are closing the outbreak at Mount Carmel Nursing and Rehab Center in Manchester. We are opening one new outbreak at Granite Recovery Centers in Salem. They have 36 resident cases and three staff. So currently we have five congregate living outbreaks. We have two in long-term care, one at a recovery center, and two in corrections. That's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, with that, we can open up for, uh, for questions. Um, I mean, I think we've seen um, for the last couple of weeks, uh, especially in kind of that younger population, whether it's colleges or, fo or, or those areas of the community, as Dr. Chan said, you know, we have to be vigilant with uh, community spread. It's still very real. It can still very much affect folks. We have um, the majority, unfortunately, the majority of, of any of the fatalities that we're seeing now are community driven, really not in, in, in long term care. So, um, you know, I think it's I think it's springtime. I think people are, are getting a lot of COVID fatigue. I think we're getting lax about our wearing masks and social distancing. Uh, we are not out of this yet. Um, I think what you're going to continue to see is a kind of a diverging of, of the data. You're going to see, I've always said, we're going to have COVID in some level uh, for potentially some time, maybe forever. Who, who knows? Um, it's really about getting the, the hospitalizations and the fatality rate down, which, which is continually coming down. That's all very good news. Um, but it's possible you see kind of COVID uh, the numbers of COVID bouncing around uh, for some time, hopefully within the, the younger, healthier uh, demographics that experience more asymptomatic or, or light symptoms, uh, if anything. And again, as the vaccine becomes more and more uh, available uh, and we get through, not just through group 2B, but kind of that final group of everybody who wants one can get one in the next couple months, um, obviously we, we assume that those numbers will continue to drop. But that's all the more reason folks do need to continue to get their vaccine. Yeah, so, so I just want to emphasize what the governor said is that, you know, I, I, we know how this virus spreads. It spreads person to person. Uh, we know that it primarily spreads through a person's respiratory droplets. And so all of the measures we have at, at our disposal to prevent this from spreading uh, are, are effective. We know how to prevent this virus from spreading person to person. Um, the, the, the struggle and the difficulty is, um, you know, more than a year now into this pandemic, getting people to continue to practice the social distancing, uh, to wear the face masks, to avoid, you know, larger group and social gatherings, right? I, I mean, this has been a long, a long response and a long pandemic. Um, and I would say that there is hope or light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. That's with the rollout of the, of the vaccine. But we're going to be vaccinating people over, you know, weeks to months. Um, and even as we enter the summer, um, there are segments of the population that uh, are not authorized to get the vaccine. So thinking, you know, younger children. Uh, we expect that at some point the vaccine will become authorized and approved for, for you know, our children in our state. But it's going to be a process of rolling out vaccine. Um, and you know we will we will be at this for uh, a number of weeks or months longer, and so continue to stress the importance of not only getting the vaccine when when it's offered to them, but also continuing to practice uh, the social distancing, the, the face mask use. Right, we want to be able to relax restrictions and help relieve some of the um, emotional, mental strain that people are feeling now, a year plus into this pandemic. Um, and it's certainly the goal to be able to relax restrictions, but in order to um, be able to take these steps, uh, we need to maintain control of the virus and prevent it from spreading you know, at high levels in our community, and that requires people to continue to adhere to the social distancing and the face mask use. Do you have a sense, Doctor, of when the ballpark time frame for when children might be 
made eligible for vaccine? I'm sorry, not eligible, but might, when it might be ruled safe. Yeah, so, so there are, are studies ongoing right now um, by the, the uh, pharmaceutical companies that are studying uh, safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines in younger, younger populations. Um, the, the same um, types of extensive long studies that have been conducted in adults likely are not going to be conducted also in children. They're going to use the data we already have and the data from some of these other what we call phase two, phase three um, studies in children to uh, look at effectiveness and safety in children. And you know the hope is that um, come sometime in the summer that we'll begin to hear, hear more about some of these studies and whether the vaccine may be authorized for children. So you know again we're we're going off what we're hearing from the federal government, but what we've heard is that. Uh, potentially by the end of summer, um, beginning of the next school year, some of these vaccines may have enough data associated with them to be able to begin to offer them to, to children. Um, but you know, this is a, a little bit of a moving target. Thanks. Governor, do you have any um, further insight into uh, summer guidance gatherings, you know, inside, outside, and any sense of what we could see this summer in terms of guidance? I keep saying plan big. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're looking at, uh, when we talk about the performing arts, uh, guidance that we put forth today, loosening a lot of those restrictions on capacity, or just making it a little more simpler, a little more flexible for folks. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of venues that, uh, regardless of where we go with our guidance, uh, choose to be a little even more restrictive for their own behalf and uh, for the confidence of a lot of their, their customers that could come through the door, not just in performing arts, but for fairs or whatever, or what you what, what have you. But those events are going to take place, and we're going to find a way to do it um, without a doubt. And like I said, I, I tell everyone to plan big, plan for a successful summer, and a summer that looks more like 2019 than 2020. Um, do you have any further thoughts on, uh, I mean, we're still hearing from some teachers who live in New Hampshire, but they work in another state, they're just not able to get the vaccine. Yeah, there's, we, uh, we've heard a, a couple cases of teachers that live here, but they teach across the border. Um, you know, if you teach in a New Hampshire school, regardless of where you live, we're, we're making sure that you get the vaccine. Uh, we want that to be reciprocated across, across the borders, but we can't force uh, folks in other states, uh, in our bordering states, to, to do that. So um, again, our, our job when it comes to teachers and as, as a prioritization is to make sure that our classrooms are safe for our kids and that transmission within our schools are safe and that's why they really need to be teaching within our borders and our classrooms. So that's how we uh, allocate the vaccine. If they are 50 and up, they can get the vaccine starting on, uh, or registered to get the vaccine just starting this coming Monday. So um, I think it's we're in a, a bit of a transition phase and, and hopefully as we start, start within the next few weeks get, getting everybody into the system, um, this kind of dissection of this state's doing this and that state's doing that, I think that'll ultimately go away pretty quickly because we're just getting the vaccine, all getting the vaccine out very, very quickly. Now that Penny is up and running, if folks um, had tried to get on the vans, have been unable to get an appointment or not gotten moved up, should they? Yes. They go on to Vinny, or yep. should they call two one one to? No, go go right on to Vinny. Okay. Yeah. If you haven't if you haven't been into if you haven't registered in the old van system yet, um, then yes, you can go on to, to Vinny and, and register there. Uh, even if you're with a Group One A or Group One B or whatever it might be. So going forward, it's it's everything. But if folks are working in the van system now. That's really through Group um, 1B, uh, and those first shots, those are, are those final first shots, are really being administered this week and next week. So there's not even a whole lot of chance to move folks up just because we're here, right? We're, we're at that point. So um, it, it, that's why I think it made a very nice transition period going from Group 1B to Group 2A uh, to open up the new state system. And, and so far, it seems to be working fairly well. We've seen the states of uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island this week set up a schedule for everyone to be vaccinated, uh, adults that is. Do you have a sense on when you'll be able to? I think we're just that? weeks away. We haven't set a, a fixed date on it, um, but we are, are just weeks away. Again, we that'll be a very large cohort of individuals, right? So we just want to make sure that the system can handle it, any adjustments to the system that might have to be made, and make sure that those 50 and up, still they are still of higher risk uh, than everybody else, and so we want to make sure, uh, sticking to our protocols and our strategy of uh, administering the vaccine based on health risk, uh, we're sticking to that. And so we want to make sure if you're 50 and up, you do get kind of your first shot at getting into the system and getting the, the, the appointment of your choice. Um, and again, I, I think some folks will be um, registering on the 22nd and getting their vaccine like the 22nd or the 23rd. It's, it's 
we're not waiting weeks away here. Uh, folks can register and, and get the vaccine almost immediately. Don't have to get in at 8 a.m. No one, everyone doesn't need to rush into the system at 8 a.m. on the 22nd by any means. Um, there's a lot of spots available, and there'll be a lot of opportunity to move up. Uh, kind of flying blind here because we don't have the veterans report in front of us, but sure. was there anything in that report that you didn't like that needed to be improved that is upsetting you? No, no. I think everything in the report was, um, I don't want to say as expected, but it was thorough. It covered all different aspects of operations at the New Hampshire Veterans Home. Um, it was uh, very positive, frankly. It really, I think, covered a lot of bases in terms of the protocols that they had administered. I think it cleared up a lot of the misinformation that was out there about what had happened. Uh, up at the veterans home and that they did have the N95, they did have the PPE, they did have the testing capacity, all that was there for them, uh, unlike some of the rumors that you heard. Um, and when it, came to, when it came to making sure that they're fitting their PPE appropriately, you know, there's some recommendations around that, but um, there was nothing glaringly negative or anything like that. I think it just speaks to um, what those, that staff and what the, that the administration, the staff there, uh, went through. They put everything they had into protecting those residents. God bless them for doing it. Uh, they never gave up. They did the right thing. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that the outbreak happened. We've seen outbreaks all over the country. It was one of the more severe outbreaks we had in the state, to be sure. But the staff really did, if anything, what I took from that, that report is the staff, the credit that we've been giving them, they deserve. And, and thank God they were there for those residents. New Hampshire has a very low vaccine wastage rate. Uh, some states have wait lists, though, for vaccines that people can move up more quickly if somehow there is an event where extra vaccine becomes available. Mm. Will New Hampshire add a wait list at any point, do you think? No, you know, I think Perry and his team, if I may, have done a very good job of, of when we, we because we, uh, we schedule things very specifically. Um, so at the end of the day, per se, we may have a little bit of vaccine available, and we'll, folks will get on the phone, and we make sure it doesn't get wasted. And some of the states where you see wait lists and things of that nature, some of those are these open um, uh, vaccine sites where you're not registering for a time. It's just we're going to take the first 5,000 people that show up and, uh, you know, everyone kind of gets in line. And maybe they have a little extra, maybe they don't. Um, if we have extra at the end of the day, sometimes it could become maybe because someone didn't show up or a spouse didn't come. We always have to make estimates a little bit about if the spouses are going to come with the, with the, um, the folks. You can you register to do that, but it's always a little bit variable, and we like to accommodate. So, again, I think just the team has done a great job estimating, uh, understanding the, the pushes and pulls of, of folks coming in and out. And, and if we have some, we, we're, we're always on the phone reusing it. But those wait lists that you see in other states are really for... Just to be honest, they don't do it as good as we do. I don't know a better way to say it. They, they don't estimate and, and understand and schedule like we do. We go to really extra lengths to, to schedule because from a customer standpoint, we want folks to feel secure that that vaccine is waiting for them. They shouldn't have to get in line and just hope, cross their fingers and hope for the best. We really want to make sure that we're there for them and we're living up to that expectation. And I think Perry and his team do a phenomenal job of that. Do we have some questions on the phone? That we can uh, yes, Governor, we do. Um, the next question comes from Holly Raymer with the Associated Press. Holly, please go ahead with your question. Hi, thanks. I have two, um, hopefully, quick questions. Um, you talked about the, the diverging numbers and the expectation that the number of cases might remain stable, but hospitalizations and deaths will decline. Uh, but I noticed that the hospitalization number went from 66 on Tuesday to 79 yesterday. Is there any insight about that increase or was that just a, a blip? Um, and my other question is when we get to the point in a couple of weeks when vaccination is open to all adults, what are the rules going to be um, for out-of-state college students? We have this ongoing debate all the time about domicile and residency for voting, but what about vaccination? Uh, two great questions. First, uh, yeah, the, the hospitalization number did bounce up for the first time in a while here, just a little bit. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to necessarily call it a blip. I, I don't think that um, those are individuals that are in the hospital. They aren't blips. They have, those are real citizens that, that need uh, health care. So the good news is we have capacity in our system to handle it. But again, as I think we see that second shot really permeate through the 65 and up. Um, uh, demographic and then ultimately the 50 and up demographic, there's no way uh, that, that we're not going to see a drop in the hospitalizations long term. Um, and by long term, I mean, you know, a few weeks, a month away. So, um, you know, you're going to, nothing is, is always completely consistent. I think you're seeing, a, you're going to see a little bit of up and down, but generally a consistent trend down is, is our hope. But if, it, if it's not, if we can't find that stabilization for whatever reason, 
Um, you know, we'll obviously kind of relook at why, why that might be, but um, all the indications are that uh, you know the, uh, it's working. We're seeing the reduction of the hospitalizations and fatalities, as Dr. Chan mentioned, specifically in long-term care. They were the first ones to be offered the vaccine. Uh, they were the first group to really get completely vaccinated uh, with their second shots for those who wanted it. And that, that's where we're seeing the, the best and most positive results. So um, it only stands to reason that we're going to see those throughout the, the remainder of, of the, uh, the demographics. Um, in terms of rules for uh, college students and, and both in and out of state college students, uh, it, frankly, it's a great question. And I think we'll kind of look at before we, that's one of, there's probably that group and maybe three or four other demographics and potential I'll call them in and outside residents, people that are, are here or part-time, maybe folks that got a shot in another state, but they're going to get their second shot here. All of that we'll really look at uh, over the next couple of weeks and make sure that we define it really clearly for folks as, uh, you know, before we release anything. And the next question comes from Nancy West with In-Depth New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Uh, Nancy, please go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you, Governor, for taking my question. Um, I have three. And the first one, we've been getting a lot of reaction to the proposed merger of the two college systems. And I know we published an op-ed piece by former trustees who said merging of the two boards and governance functions will result in a consolidation that will negatively impact the effectiveness of both of our vital higher education enterprises. Now, I guess my question would be, um, why did we wait so long to tackle this issue and now it seems like a hurry up and wait and are you going to restore the 17.5 million to the both systems budget this year when it seems like they need more money I have a couple more do you want me to ask no let, let me yeah Nancy let me take that one if I could so I did see that letter from okay. the former trustee some former trustees of the community college system that are not uh, in favor um, to be very blunt about it I guess I expect that reaction from folks that, that were in the system years ago and that aren't really on the front lines of how the sense of transi both systems have transitioned and need to transition just over the past, not just through COVID, but maybe the last two or three years. So um, I, I, I get it. I can appreciate those, those sentiments, but they're not on the front lines. They aren't seeing what the faculty, the students, and the current administration in both of the community college and the university system are seeing a paradigm change, a completely different change in, in decision-making processes um, that has to be acknowledged. You cannot kick the can down the road anymore. To your, to your point, um, this is something that folks have talked about. We have to have the courage to go in and do it. And it's Republicans and Democrats on both sides of the aisle, they all agree that this can be done, it should be done, it's a better process for the students, it's a better process for our system with synergies and, and, and not just cost savings, but um, synergies of, of the back end systems, if you will, credits transferring, ultimately providing real choice for those individuals and those kids going through, um, going through that, that process. It's just a better product at the end of the day. Uh, and so I'm still very, very confident that, that, it, that it will get done. Um, go to the next one, Nancy. Okay, the only other things I wanted to ask you about are, will you have final say over where the state dollars are spent that are coming in through this new stimulus program as you did with the CARES Act, or will there be uh, some authority granted that or with the Legislative Fiscal Committee or the Executive Council, or will you have that final authority again? The only other thing, I would love it if you could um, talk a little bit more about these modified guidances for amusement park and tourist training. Will they be back to 100% or, or roughly what will that mean? Sure. So um, in terms of the CARES Act, when it was released, you know, first passed in March and April of last year, that's when we were in the crisis emergency mode. We still have an emergency, to be sure, but we're not in that crisis mode. Um, and the legislature is in session, and uh, I feel very confident the legislature uh, is going to have a lot of say in how the vast majority of these funds are spent. I think Gopher and HHS will still spend the, the kind of that critical care uh, dollars when it comes to vaccinations or testing or things of that nature. Um, but the, I think the vast majority of the money we're seeing to the state uh, will go through a legislative process. It could be through the fiscal committee. Uh, a lot of that will ultimately go through the executive council and have that checks and balances with it because it's not directly attached to the, the crisis of the moment. So much of this $1.9 trillion spending bill had nothing to do with COVID. And so if those dollars come through, we'll make sure that 
that um, you know that those checks and balances are there because they're not in a crisis mode. They're really in an opportunity mode for our citizens. Oh, and as for the uh, the guidance documents. Again, they, I believe they're all online now, so you can see the details online. Um, it doesn't open everything to 100% capacity, but it addresses some of the issues of uh, where social distancing and masking really needs to be um, you know, adhered to, uh, to ensure that uh, in a closed atmosphere or a, an atmosphere where multiple groups are getting together uh, within uh, close proximity, that we're still maintaining the distancing um, that we need to. And sometimes that, that still may result in, in limited capacity or less than 100% capacity. But all those details are online for you to check out. Is there a third question? Or is I that it? I think that was it. Oh, okay. And the next question comes <coughs> from Carol Robido with Manchester Inc. Link. Carol, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. I think the first question is a two-part vaccine question. I'll start there. Um, and maybe this is for uh, Dr. Chan, but when vaccines were first rolled out in about mid-December, uh, there was talk that the efficacy rate was not known past 90 days. So we are right now at that 90-day mark. Um, and I'm wondering, what does the medical community know about the lasting efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines um, beyond the 90 days? And can you talk about um, how people will know if the vaccines they're getting now are still effective after those 90 days. Um, for example, are there going to be antibody testing sites so people know their vaccines are still working or will we need booster shots? Um, and, and if there's a booster shot plan, contingency plan, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, thanks for that question. Um, I think there's a, a couple points to be made in there, and I think the first is that um, we do not believe that vaccine protection lasts only for 90 days. So, so to say that a different way, we, we believe that protection um, likely lasts much longer. How long um, protection lasts after vaccination, I think, is, is something that we still don't have great numbers on. It's still They're still being studied. Um, the vaccine trials, the phase three vaccine trials, which the pharmaceutical companies have conducted uh, that were used to grant authorization for use by the FDA, those vaccine trials are being, are, are being conducted for two years, right? So, so there's still gonna be more data to come, both from um, the official you know, vaccine trials that have been conducted, as well as from, from real world use. I haven't seen any um, new or recent data to um, suggest how long vaccine protection lasts for, um, but we believe it's, it's, it's likely much longer than 90 days. Where, where this 90-day um, issue came in is, is, I think, partly around some of the, the guidance early on um, that the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released, um, where the, the initial recommendation from the CDC was that people that are fully vaccinated um, do not need to quarantine if they have a new exposure within 90 days of vaccination. That, I think, was misinterpreted to mean that vaccination only lasts for 90 days, and that's not the case. We've, we've never um, adopted that time frame uh, to vaccination. We've always said, even going back to the beginning of January, that if somebody is fully vaccinated, uh, that uh, if they have a new exposure, if they travel, they do not need to quarantine, period. Uh, no, no time frame put on that. Um, that partly is because we, we want to instill confidence in the vaccines. Uh, we believe immunity um, lasts likely for, for months, um, if not years. Uh, but how long immunity and protection lasts for, I, I think it still, still remains to be seen. And so to your other question about whether a booster shot may be needed, um, there, there are maybe a couple reasons why a booster shot could be required in the future, but there's no recommendation for one yet. Again, the data and the science around this is still evolving. A booster shot could be required because, as um, you're asking, there, there could be evidence of decreasing immunity or protection in the future. Um, but also we have new variants that are circulating, variants of concern, some of which um, have shown um, to have increased potential to escape immunity from vaccination, meaning the vaccine may be less effective against some of these variants. And so pharmaceutical companies are, in fact, studying um, updated booster shots um, to see if 
there may be one required in the future. But, but these, are, these are studies that are still ongoing. Um, right now, there's not a recommendation or a requirement for somebody to get a booster shot. But I suspect that over the coming you know, months, um, as more and more vaccine rolls out, as some of these studies are conducted, uh, we'll have more information in the future to be able to make an informed decision about whether a booster shot um, may be needed in the future or not. But for right now, we believe the vaccines that we have um, as they're recommended, um, are very effective, especially at preventing severe disease, preventing hospitalizations, preventing deaths. Um, and we encourage people to complete their series of uh, vaccination. Um, so if they get, for example, the Pfizer, do the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, those are two dose series. Um, people should absolutely get the second dose um, to be sure that they have the highest level of protection and the longest lasting uh, protection. Thanks. Carol, was there another question? I did. Um, it's related to that, um, and I don't know if this is relevant at this moment, but I was reading that Pfizer was projecting a $15 billion profit in 2021 from the vaccine, and uh, also talking about raising that profit margin by two or three hundred percent, especially with the strains of um, vaccines, the strains of COVID that might not be responsive to the, to the initial vaccines, et cetera. And I know we've had price gouging lawsuits in the past against some of the pharmaceuticals. Is there some way for New Hampshire to safeguard its residents against uh, a future of, of high price vaccines if, this is, if for some reason we need to get annual boosters or new shots because there's new strains that are covered? Um, you know, is there something that New Hampshire can do to protect citizens? Uh, right now, I, I guess the vaccines are not costing people a pile of money, but it sounds like there's a lot of potential uh, for profit on these vaccines. Yeah, so uh, I have one more oh, question after that. Okay, so uh, let me answer that one real quick. The quick answer is. Um, just to be very clear, citizens do not have to pay for vaccines. The citizens, it, it, I mean, other than through the, your tax dollars, but the federal government is providing the vaccines and providing uh, all the costs around that and, and allowing the state, providing some dollars to the state for the administration and whatnot. So I just want the citizens to know you, you when you sign up, you, you do not have to uh, pay for vaccines. If down the road, uh, you know, if a yearly vaccine came up, um, whether it was with insurance companies, whether it was with on the citizens, and if there was price gouging, of course, we would always protect the citizens um, interest when it comes to price gouging, whether it's on pharmaceuticals or, or frankly, almost any product that, that's out there. So um, we have we have a, you know, kind of a bureau that, that looks into that stuff. And there's a lot of different avenues you can take depending on the situation. But luckily, that is not the situation today. I don't I can't respond to anything having to do with their profit margins. We, I don't know anything about that. But we'll protect any price gouging that that would potentially happen in the future around this issue. And Carol, your third. <clears throat> okay, this one. Um this one is for all my friends in the downtown area who are operating bars and restaurants that have music capacity but are not, or music capabilities but are not able to have live music or uh, live music beyond like a single acoustic person or something like that in capacity issues. And I know there's been some relaxation of some of the guidances. Um, I don't know if you've talked specifically about these venues that don't necessarily have an outdoor setting but have indoor uh, capacity. What does that look like for the near future? Do you well, that, yeah, last week, last week we allowed small live bands. Yeah, we, we made that that uh, okay. that flexibility in the rules um, uh, a week ago. But, but what's what there? What's the capacity of um, of uh, the restaurant still restricted to six foot or is it three foot? Uh, so in terms of the the patrons okay. at the restaurants, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean yeah. the, the the capacity within the individuals and the restaurant still stays as it is. You can have up to 100% capacity, but you have to have six feet between the parties and whatnot. And we did provide some flexibility for the bar areas and things of that nature. And then on top of that, we provided some flexibilities to have, I believe, up to you know small three-person bands and you know making sure that there's a safe distance between the bands and the individuals. Um, we did have issues around karaoke and karaoke and singing, but we've provided we've been able in working with Dr. Chan and his team. I think did a great job providing. Uh, the ability to allow that to happen in a safe in a, in a safe way with uh, some some distancing between the performers uh, and the audience itself. And the next question comes from Michael Graham with New Hampshire Journal. Michael, please go ahead with your question. 
I have 11 questions I'd like to answer alphabetically. No. I'm ready. Let's let's do it. Uh, hey. <laughs> no, no, just one. Just one. Uh, the makeup the school system uh, sent out a message to employees ordering them to undergo anti-whiteness training. Uh, they then rescinded it and said it was merely a suggestion after questions were asked. Uh, the supporters of HB 544 that you promised to veto say this shows that people need protection from this kind of divisive, ideologically driven uh, encounter, specifically with government. And so the question to have is, since you uh, pledged to veto the bill, should government workers have to be called racist and bigots in order to keep their jobs? Uh Boy, I mean, I, I guess I'll just say this. Uh, to your point, uh, we've we heard about the issue in Manchester, but we again also received assurances this was uh, an optional, I think, a free training or something like that uh, that uh, that some of the employees could could um, enter into if if they chose to. Um, you know, when it comes to this issue of um, divisive uh, discussion in in classrooms and whatnot, I I always am going to err on the side of. I'm very cautious of big government getting involved, telling people what they can and cannot say. And that's why we're a local control state. That's the beauty of being a local control state. Um, if, you, if as a parent, and I'm a parent of students, if there's issues of, of what's being discussed in the classroom, I always have the ability to talk to the teachers, to work with the school board, uh, and work at that local level to have a very strong voice. But when big government comes in and says, you shall not say this and you shall not talk about that, um, I, you, that's a very slippery slope. It really is because, um, you know, one side might, might like what's being prevented from being discussed in a classroom today, and maybe the other side gets in control uh, down the road and they start putting uh, restrictions in. And next thing you know, we become a system and a government of, of really uh, oversight and, and monitoring every last word that comes out of uh, an individual's mouth, not just in the classrooms, but in the workplace. It's um, it's a very slippery slope to start going down. I, I know it for some folks. It's a, it's a it's a passionate issue, but I think the real answer is then the solutions are at that local level between parents, teachers, and administrators, uh, and finding that that pathway forward. And Governor, our final phone question comes from Ali Pham with New Hampshire Public Radio. Ali, please go ahead with your question. Thank you. So my question is that. Um, State data shows that Black and Latino residents are getting vaccinated at roughly half the rate of white residents. And a new report published by the CDC also shows the state of New Hampshire falling behind others in other states in vaccinating highly vulnerable communities. So I'm wondering, does this signal a need for New Hampshire to adjust its vaccine equity strategy? Uh, yeah, the quick answer to that is is no, but I'm going to turn to Dr. Daly. I'm, I know she and her team have been right on top of this and doing a fantastic job uh, with the equity portion of, of making sure that uh, folks from uh, whatever their background, wherever they might live, um, have that equitable dis distribution. But I'll turn it over to Dr. Daly for some details. So thank you for asking this question. We think this is a really important topic. In terms of the data the department released last week for the first time on race and ethnicity, distribution for vaccination. Um, those data did show that uh, people who are white have higher vaccination coverage than people who are not identifying as white. However, when we analyzed those data, that the population that we used to make that calculation was for all persons in New Hampshire in that particular group. It did not take into consideration who's actually eligible for the vaccine based on our vaccination rollout. So for example, in New Hampshire, if you look at people over the age of 65, who's primarily who we're vaccinating in phase 1B, um, that population is more white. It's about 96% white. Whereas when you look at younger populations, like populations under the age of 18, they're 84% white. So much more diverse, younger population here in New Hampshire. And so if you really wanted to understand what the uh, race and ethnicity um, vaccination coverage is in our state, it would be important to take an age-based approach to look at that. Uh, we didn't have that date type of data available when we released the report, and we wanted to be transparent and provide what we did have, but we are certainly looking more closely. I suspect it could still show that there is vari variability based on race and ethnicity, which is exactly why we have made a commitment to ensuring equitable distribution of vaccine. Which brings me to the report that you mentioned from the CDC, which they conducted an assessment looking at areas that are considered to be vulnerable and whether states are making good progress in reaching vulnerable populations. 
this report and the analysis is actually just based on county level vaccination rates. They looked at which counties are more, more vulnerable than others based on a lot of different factors like education and income level and other things that can make us vulnerable. And so essentially this report is, is uh, showing differences at the county level comparing different counties to one another and what the variability is. And our state does have variability across the counties at the county level. And there's reasons for that uh, that have nothing to do with vulnerable populations. Some of it could have to do with vulnerable populations. But for example, when we rolled out phase 1A, we had a higher proportion of people in Grafton County getting vaccinated. And that was because Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center is there and they have a lot of healthcare workers. Uh, so there's a lot of factors when you look at, at, at the county level like that. What we're doing in New Hampshire is using a different index than what CDC presented their data on. We are using the COVID Community Vulnerability Index, and it's a much more granular index that actually looks at census tracts. And we're looking at that level of data to target very vulnerable census tracts to, um, to uh, carry out vaccination events, working with our partners to reach those vulnerable populations. So that CDC report is not actually comparing vulnerable population vaccine coverage, it's really comparing counties. And what we're doing in New Hampshire um, is looking at really vulnerable pockets within census tracts, which is different than that county level. And if you read that report, they make a number of recommendations and highlight best practices in this regard. And in New Hampshire, we're doing almost all of those best practices already. We're reaching people who have access barriers for transportation, who are homebound, who have language barriers. Um, we're you know, reaching vulnerable populations in terms of race, racial and ethnic minority groups. Uh, so we're doing a lot in this area and it's a big commitment of ours and we've dedicated 10% of our vaccine each week to our equity allocation. Told you, she's wicked smart. Thank you, Beth, Dr. Daly, that, that was, that's terrific. And they are doing a great job. It's one of the, the, the really where a lot of our emphasis and effort has been going, uh, really on a one-on-one -on -one basis, which, is, which has been terrific. Questions are all set. Great. What else we got? I ask a question of Dr. Chan, a school related question. Um, there's a new study that has just come out uh, stating that whether you're three feet apart or six <clears throat> feet apart, if everyone's wearing a mask, the um, infection rate of COVID is the same. Can you just kind of hit on what this, the, where the state falls on the three feet versus six feet, as well as talk about um, the quarantine guidance if there's a known exposure? Yeah, yeah. thanks for that question about schools and. Uh, physical distancing in schools and quarantine guidance. This is actually a, a, a topic that we talked about with our school partners on our uh, weekly occurring um, uh, partner call. Um, so this, the study that you're referencing, I, I think was just published last week in the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases, and it was actually a study right out of Massachusetts. Um, and they were looking at a, a statewide cohort group of um, school districts and comparing uh, school districts. So first off, all, all the schools had universal masking, right? So, you know, all, all students, staff were required to wear masks um, in, in throughout the state. Um, and so they were able to compare um, and look at infection rates in schools and school districts that allowed a minimum of three feet of physical distancing between students in classrooms versus a minimum of six feet of physical distancing uh, in, in classrooms. And what the study found was no difference in infection rates uh, in students or staff when comparing the, these, these two groups based on the, the difference in physical disting, distancing requirements. Um, and in fact, um, both school, uh, all school districts had lower rates of infection in the school than in the, in the surrounding community. And, and so there, there has been um, increasing um, evidence over the last couple of months from multiple studies, in fact, um, that schools do not appear to be uh, a high risk setting for spread or transmission of COVID-19. And there's likely a couple factors um, to this. One is that uh, we believe children in general are less likely to spread infection um, to other people. Uh, and then schools tend to be um, monitored, controlled settings where there are requirements, mask use, physical distancing, cohorting or grouping of students, um, you know, attention to hand hygiene, you know, controlled, you know, student movement and flow. Um, and so for, for a variety of reasons, and this has been our experience as well in New Hampshire, we have found um, schools to be low risk settings for spread of COVID-19. Um, and so right from the beginning of the school year, um, going back to the um, back to the grades K through 12 back to school guidance that was released at the end of um, August um, by the Department of Education, uh, the state has allowed schools to um, 
seat students within three feet of each other. So, you know, minimum of three feet of physical distancing. Obviously, the, the recommendation is to try and maximize physical distancing to the extent possible, you know, aiming for, you know, four, five, six feet if possible. Um, but in settings where students are within three to six feet of other students seated in the classroom, um, there continues to be a recommendation that mask use be used. And so this is exactly the, the type of situation that the study out of Massachusetts um, has evaluated and found no difference in infection rates based on physical distancing. Um, and so we have um, taken the step of um, in the controlled, monitored, educational classroom setting, um, have taken the step of not requiring quarantine um, if students are seated within three feet or more of each other and are consistently and appropriately wearing masks. And so that's, that's a change to um, some of our um, quarantine guidance uh, for exposures in school settings that is um, specific to the educational setting. Um, otherwise, in, in other areas where there might be uncontrolled movement, movement between people, um, unmonitored use of masks, for example, we're, we're, still, we're still sticking with the uh, you know, six feet physical distancing as the, the cutoff of the criteria for um, you know, quarantining somebody if there's been an exposure. Thanks. Governor, uh, we know you touched on the making vaccine available or registration opening to everybody in a, in a matter of weeks. Do you think it's still realistic for the president uh, to say that, you know, all adults should be able to get shots hopefully by May 1st? I hope so. Yeah. I, is it realistic? I think they could do it. I mean, I, I, everything I've seen in talking to the folks at Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, we've talked to some executives in all those different uh, uh, companies. Um, if their manufacturing schedule stays on target, if they keep it, 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 it getting the vaccine out, um, as they, I think they could, yeah, we, we could make that level. It really depends on the uptake, though, right? I mean, if everyone in America got a vaccine, I think that'd be great. I don't know if we're going to make the end of May, per se. But I think the whole point is everyone should um, kind of be registered, at least in the system, their, or their respective systems across the country by May, and hopefully have that assurance that it's coming, even if they might not have the shot or, or both shots in the arm with the 14-day um, kind of incubation time for the antibodies to build. Uh, they, they should be in the system, hopefully. Here in New Hampshire, we're, we're going to get everyone uh, signed up, um, at least the opportunity to sign up well before then, you know, month month ahead of, uh, of that schedule. Um, we'll see what they deliver. And uh, it was a number of months ago you were up here, you know, touting the findings of the Lead Commission, saying you're 100% mm -hmm. behind them. Um, as we speak, potentially, they're talking about this in the state Senate right now. And some of those things could be going a little sideways in terms of the data collection. Is it time uh, for you to ride in, bring in the cavalry to try to come to bear in some way to make sure that the endorsement or that the recommendations you endorse do make it to the yeah. finish line? Well, there were dozens and dozens of recommendations that we, had, we endorsed, uh, I think over 40, something like that. Um, and I think the vast majority of them, if they're not already in place, um, some required executive order, some we were able to put in place right away, some require legislation. Uh, a lot of that required legislation are going to move forward, which is good. There could be some stragglers here and there. They want to study some more. They want to look at more data, I suppose. Um, I'm not sure where it'll all ultimately end up, but uh, no, I think the legislature is doing a decent job of taking it all very seriously, looking at the data, getting the testimony. I'm not sure what's going to come out of it. I know something will, and something will be sub substantial, and um, it's all going to be for the good. Uh, and if something, if you don't get 100% of what you want in a piece of legislation, you don't just say, oh, well, I guess we didn't do our job. No, we're, we're talking about transformative issues here. I mean, really good stuff, uh, moving us uh, really where we need to be. And just because you don't get something done today doesn't mean you don't, can't come back to it tomorrow and try again. So I'm not sure what the legislature is going to pass. I, I know there's definitely a lot of positivity and positive momentum with a lot of these issues. Some might, they might want to study or discuss some more, but we'll keep at them. Should you fight for it, though? Oh, I, look, I think, I, I think I've been very clear about how adamant I am about wanting to see those, those, to, get those, to, those to move forward. But ultimately, the legislature is going to do what the legislature does. You know, I've, I've made our position very, very clear. Um, I've talked to leadership about these issues. Um, you know, I, I guess we'll just see where the votes come out on, on both the House and the Senate side. And even if one body doesn't pass it, sometimes another body will pick it up and put it into another piece of legislation, give it another life and another, another chance. So uh, we'll see what happens. But I've, I've made our, my support of those uh, recommendations and initiatives very clear. Speaking of support, uh, what do you say to people who uh, take issue with or find it hypocritical that you tout the spending coming from the stimulus bill but did say that you would have voted against it. Well, again, I think it's very clear. I've, my ask of the Senate and Congress, uh, our, our representatives in Washington, was to fix it. The spending 
allocation was unfair. There's no doubt. And that's what I really was holding up, and, and I think they should have held up. But we're just taking one, like one, one vote to potentially go to Chuck Schumer and say, I'm not voting for this until you make sure everyone is treated fairly. Um, and they didn't do that. They weren't, they weren't willing to do it. Um, there's a lot of spending in there that has nothing to do with COVID, right? And I just think that should have been taken separately. It would have taken one individual, uh, likely on the Democrat side, to stand up and say, let's just take these apart or you're not going to get my support. And then they would have been forced to, to, to take an alternative method and had a, uh, a more public discussion on all these non-COVID related items. I think it's great that the, the COVID related money is coming. I think there's a lot of financial opportunity. But at the end of the day, there's no doubt, the math very clearly shows, New Hampshire citizens are putting extra money in to pay for states like California and Andrew Cuomo in New York. And that's not fair. That's not appropriate. That wasn't how any of the previous bills were done. But now that the Biden administration's in control, the Democrats just changed the formula. And, and I, it just would have taken one. If it, I understand if it, was an overwhelm, it had overwhelming support, but knowing that just one of our senators uh, could have stood up and, and potentially asked for a fix, not just kill the bill outright, but ask for a fix, and, and they weren't willing to do it, I think all of us are, are pretty disappointed in that. So it wasn't about just saying no. It was about you could have fixed it. You had the chance to do it, and you chose not to. And, and at the end of the day, we were left a little bit behind other states. But whatever opportunity the feds want to give us with this money, there's a lot of money here. We're going to spend it wisely, that's for sure. Governor, next week the Hudson Planning Board is to vote on this development. I think you're well aware of Amazon is looking to build one of the largest logistics centers in yeah. uh, New England on, this, on property of the Green Meadow Golf Course in Hudson. A number of it about it are concerned about traffic and other impacts from this development. Um, they say they've written to you. Uh, are you, what are your thoughts about the, the project? Yeah. Do you think it's um, a good I idea? think it's a very good project. Uh, a huge economic opportunity for the state of New Hampshire, a huge economic opportunity for Hudson, both in terms of infrastructure. Um, from the state level, our job is to make sure that traffic and environmental issues are adhered to. These folks aren't just uh, dealing with the traffic issues, they're helping existing traffic issues, right? That's how good some of the, the new traffic plans that they've agreed to are. Um, they're agreeing, they're, they've agreed to make sure that the wetlands issues and all of that are, are handled appropriately, and Commissioner Scott's been right on top of it. Um, you know, Hudson is a, is a great town. I mean, it's, all, it's really a small city uh, at this point. It's, it's really booming opportunity. And when you see all the businesses that want to be in New Hampshire, all the citizens that want to be here, all the workers that want to be here, um, all the tax benefits, if you will, right, all those folks that want to move in. And I think that it puts millions of dollars just into the town of Hudson um, from a tax base opportunity, which in effectively lowers, could lower that tax property burden for the citizens of Huston, Hudson by millions, um, plus all the jobs that it creates. There's just a lot of reasons that this is a huge win uh, for Southern New Hampshire. But the town has local control, right? I'm a local control guy, and the, and the planning board has to agree to it. I know there's a few abutters there that are concerned about traffic and whatnot. Um, but at the end of the day, that's a very industrial area. Uh, you know, there's a, it's a lot of commercial uh, businesses and industrial businesses. It's right off the main highway. It's very proximate to uh, the Manchester Airport. All of those are just uh, huge opportunities. So. I understand um, with these projects, you always get a small uh, cohort of individuals who, uh, in the abutters, and it's, it's reasonable. They should have their say, and, and they should bring their concerns to the town level. But it's a great project, and we're very hopeful it'll move forward. They did write me a letter, um, and we responded. I sent a letter back today, um, or maybe even yesterday, um, just you know, talking about all these issues I just uh, discussed with you. But I think it's a, it, could, it could be a great win, but the town of Hudson has, uh, ultimately has to approve it. Okay. Good. Great. Well, that was exciting. Well, thank you guys. Uh, all good stuff. We keep moving forward. Everyone enjoy the weather this weekend. It's going to be actually beautiful across the state, so we hope folks get out. Uh, we will be back next week. And remember, on March 22nd, that's this coming Monday, if you are 50 and up, you can go to Vinny. Uh, Vinny takes care of all your problems, right? He's going to uh, – everyone can get right into the system. Uh, you don't have to pile in at, at 8 a.m. Hundreds of thousands of, of opportunities to get your vaccine over the next few weeks, uh, and we'll keep building uh, some of our successes from there. Thank you guys very much.